been a speaker and supporter of SNAP and has attended every single meeting that we've had. And he has, he's affiliated with an, a compliance company, used to be called Optometric Business Solutions, now I think it's called Practice Compliance Solutions. And I probably text him, he probably wishes I didn't have his personal cell phone number, because I'm texting him probably once a month with some employee issue I'm dealing with and, you know, how do I, you know, what's legal, what can I do legally? And he, he, makes, he basically offers HIPAA compliant um, information, posters for your office. He's going to talk today about social media and how we stay compliant when we have to respond, if we decide to respond to some social media responses. And I just can't say enough about him. All of the information in their company is state specific. So he's done all of the research. So if you reach out to him and hire him, um, he, everything that you get will be, will be customized for your state. Dr. Coppolo uses his services as well. And I want to let Dr. Coppolo say a few things and then we'll invite Dr. Jill Yes, thank you very much. Um, Joe, it's great to have you back again. Like, a, uh, like Lisa said, you've been at every single meeting and, and we appreciate it. Um, prior to you know joining SNAP and starting SNAP, I had never heard of, of Joe. And since listening to his lectures, um, every time I do, I go away, I walk away with something you know, even more important than the one before. So after some consultation after the last meeting, we invited him to our practice, and I want you to know that this is a very serious part of our business. And as we started, you know, years ago when we started working in this field, it just was talked about and really was never acted on. Um, I think Joe has, has brought a level of expertise and convinced us as a practice to look at it and to look at it in a serious way. So I just wanted to let you know that, that we have used his services. We recently utilized his services and we're, we're very impressed with the services. So uh, let's give a warm welcome to, to Dr. Joe Deloach. Thank you very much. <laughs> She's going, who is that? Uh, I'm not going up there. <clears throat> I wander, if, as y'all know. Um, this is great. Um, every meeting gets bigger. This looks like the biggest for sure. Yeah. Uh, and I know you'd probably had more here if some of our colleagues weren't in serious harm's way with the hurricanes. And I would encourage all y'all to do as much as you can to help our you know, our colleagues in that. Uh, I know we've been working shelters and doing a lot of stuff and it's pretty amazing when you lose everything. So reach out to them. Uh, Brooke, aren't you going to take notes? Huh? You're going to do it from there? Okay. All right. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about uh, social media. Um, and as usual, be a little bit of a twist because I'm not going to tell you how to use social media in your practice. Y'all can figure that stuff out. I'm not a practice management expert. Y'all can figure out how to do it. I'm going to try to tell you how to do it and stay out of jail. Uh, and so we got to look at the legal aspects of this whole thing of communication between us and our patients. And when we got into this, I, I personally was shocked as to what a big deal this really is. So uh, hopefully I can catch y'all up in a very, very short period of time. Disclaimers don't matter on this one. So, I mean, y'all been talking, you know, just in, I've been standing here listening, you know, it, it's all about communication, whether it's face to face or telephone or what it is. Our business is about communication with our patients. That's really what it's all about. So we have many, many ways to do that. And with, you know, kind of the age of the internet and all the things that we're going to talk about, it's really changed a great deal. So uh, what really kind of governs this? Well, there's two laws. This is pretty simple because there's really two laws that govern most every bit of what I'm going to talk about. One of them is HIPAA, which I've already talked about before, and I'm not going to talk about HIPAA again, except for as it relates to communication with our patients. But there's this other law that goes back to 1991. Yeah, Telephone Consumer Protection Act. And this is where a great deal of the legal side of what we can and can't do legally when we communicate with our patients comes from, interestingly enough. So we're going to talk about both of those. They've all been amended tremendous amounts over time, so you, as usual you have to keep up with this stuff. So let's go to this one first. This one's a little bit comical. There's always comedy in all this legal stuff. You know, it's like, really? You gotta be kidding me. 
Well, this one's the first one. It's pretty funny. In the 15 Amendment, they said that it is actually legal when a patient gives you a telephone number that you have the right to call them back at that number. And it's like, really? I didn't before? And the answer was, no, you didn't legally until they actually clarified the law this way. So we can now all rest easy and know that when they fill out their registration form and give us a phone number, it is perfectly legal to call them back at that phone number. The second one is doesn't apply to us probably too much, but it certainly could. And that is, as a doctor, as a physician, you have the right to use your best judgment to contact a third party, their spouse, uh, their daughter, their son, their caregiver, whatever, in a situation where they don't have the ability to authorize that. And if you remember your HIPAA stuff, you really don't have that authority. Uh, but this overrides that and says in case of an emergency, so it could happen, just understand that you have the right to do that. And this law clarified that. Now, this law was strictly relating to the telephone. It actually doesn't apply to email or texting, although in these two situations, probably email and texting don't apply. This is the one that got really comical. And if you think about it, kind of real. And it said, we all know y'all are hiring people like Demand Force and Solution Reach and Weave and all these people. And now we communicate with our patients using these systems. Well, the government said, wait a minute, if you're imposing a financial burden on your patient by doing that, we don't like that. So, you know, I just last month for the first time, I don't know, ever got my little notice said, you're over your limit. So I actually had to pay more because I overdid my stuff. Well, the point is, if we are, if we are involved in costing them money by use of their network plan, then they decided to make laws about that. Well, that's pretty funny, because how do you know? I mean, do they have an unlimited plan? Are we going to start putting that on our registration form? Do you have unlimited coverage under your, you know, under your network access? Silly. But it's really not that complicated, so let's simplify it, because they really talked about two different things. We're going to talk about exempt communications and non-exempt communications. So when they say if you're talking about making appointments and their care, and if you look at the bottom words here, it really is pretty easy. If you're talking about the care of the patient, this law is exempt. You can contact them all you want to. What they really wanted to stop was us badgering patients with marketing. And that's really what this all came down to. Or collection efforts. Now how would this really apply to us? Honestly, not very often. I bring it up only so that you are 100% up on all the law, but really this probably is not something that's really have a big impact on us, but you need to know about it. All right, non-exempt says you can do that. Marketing is what we're worried about. So what's marketing? Well, we have to go back and mention this ugly HIPAA thing because HIPAA was the law that defined what healthcare marketing was. So marketing is not in our optical talking about how we have this great line or we have this new digital lens or you know in our we have this wonderful new instrument our OCT that helps us manage your glaucoma better that's not marketing that's just promoting our practice marketing is a specific thing so if you want to know what is marketing and is what not you have to answer these three questions so first one says keep them in order. Does the marketing contain patient information? What are we talking about here mainly? We're mainly talking about email and text communication or your website or something like that. Does the marketing or does the communication contain patient information? Well they all do. If they start with a patient's name or anything, they have patient information. So that's always true. Number two, does it mention a specific third-party product? So this is not that we have great uh, uh, medical devices in our office. We have great frames in our office. We have great digital lenses. You have to say this marketing piece is about ABC Company's new digital progressive lens, a specific company's product. All right. The third one says, did anyone help you pay for this in any way? It doesn't have to be money. It can be free product. It can be discount on boxes of lenses you buy. Anything that is any kind of value. So 
So if you answer yes to all three of these questions, that is defined as marketing. If you answer no to any one of those questions, it is not marketing and none of these rules apply. Okay? Got it? Pretty easy. All right. So in summary, it says... We can communicate with our patients all we want to when it comes to their care, but if we start texting or emailing them a bunch about promoting our business in true marketing or in collection efforts, we got to be cognizant of how we do that. In other words, we just don't want to bombard them with that stuff. Then you're not doing that. All right. Recommendation. How do we deal with this? Everyone should have HIPAA. I know most, probably half of you don't. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but in your notice of privacy practice, you need to have a statement that says, we communicate with you by security email systems, blah, 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 so that they are on notice that you do this. Okay? So that's one thing. Anything outside of that, and we'll talk about specifically what those are in a minute, you really have to have authorization from the, authorization from the patient to communicate with them in certain ways. And we'll get into those specifics in a minute. All right. Now, <laughs> this is where it got really dicey. Because it now says we have to, no matter how we communicate with our patients, we have to protect that communication. And this is going to where we're going to ease over in towards social media stuff because any communication with our patient, whether it be Twitter, whether it be Facebook page, whether it be our website, uh, whatever we're doing, Instagram, whatever they are, we have to make sure that we are not releasing any kind of patient information. So we have to go back to HIPAA to know what that means. So HIPAA from the very beginning said we have to protect any communication with our patient that involves patient information. That was nothing, you know, nothing new. But it was very generic. And they didn't come out and define what that meant until later. And the definition got really, really specific at that point. So what is an electronic communication? It's any of those things. Fax is, an, it is considered an electronic communication. We'll talk more about fax in a little bit. So there's three ways we can communicate with our patient, whether it be social media, email, whatever we're using. There's three ways. The patient can communicate with us, we can communicate with them, or we can communicate with someone else on behalf of them. Pretty simple, right? The rules are going to be different for all three of these different communications. So let's start with number one. HIPAA rules do not apply to a patient. So a patient can communicate with us any way they want to. They can send us, you know, hot mail till the cows come home. It's perfectly legal for the patient to communicate with us any way they want to. Not a problem. But <clears throat> once we get the information. If we're going to communicate back, that's when HIPAA applies. So we didn't have really good clarification, so HIPAA clarified it for us. And they said that we require certain procedures. Well, that was real specific, wasn't it? So then they had to come out and re-amend it to say, what are certain procedures? And they said, reasonable precautions. Well, that was really good, too. Then they said, equivalent to encryption. Now, all y'all that have heard me talk, I've probably said this a million times, I am not an IT person. I don't understand IT. I do my best. But I know, know what is better than encryption. That's like the highest level of protection that we have. So if it has to be equivalent to the highest level that we have, I think the government just told us any time we communicate with our patients through email, texting, et cetera, et cetera, it has to be encrypted. Somebody else want to read it a different way, that's fine, but I'm pretty sure that's what it said. You can read that exactly with the uh, reference there on the slide. So, it says that if you do not want to protect the information, you can still talk to them, but you have to do it a certain way, and you have to counsel the patient, basically. So, this is what you have to do. You have to say, patient, we're going to communicate with each other in a non-secured way. What's a non-secured way? Gmail, Hotmail, just name them out. They're all non-secured internet transmissions. If you want us to communicate with you that way, I need to let you know that's not secure. That's number one. Number two, I need to let you know 
that that could contain information, personal information about you, and if that gets out, I, that it gets out. I can't do anything about it. And then I need you to tell me you understand what I just told you. You have to do that specifically with each and single, every one of your patients. No one is going to do that. Well, maybe you will. I don't know why you would. So, it's saying we've got to communicate with email and texting through encrypted systems. That's the bottom line. I know people don't like this, but that's what the law says. So, what is encrypted? Gmail's not. Hotmail's not. And you just list them out. Yahoo's not. Right? Any of them. None of them are. You have to have a specific encrypted system. Now, many of your EMRs have systems that do that automatically. So if you're in an EMR, and hopefully you are, uh, they have a built-in secured email system where you can communicate back and forth with your patients. You may not have activated or even know about it, but it's there. Most all the major ones do. You may also purchase a separate secured email system. And there's a bunch of them. I just threw some of them up there. Okay? My company actually uses Citrix. Um, I don't, I don't know if they're any better than anybody else. That's just what we use. Uh, but uh, those are a few. There's others. There's actually something called Google Pro or Big Google Business Pro. And you can use that one as well. The common denominator in all these, they're not free. You are going to pay for these secured systems, but they're not terribly expensive. All right. So there's what we have to do. We have to warn the patient, tell them the consequences, and then they have to authorize that. And just like anything else, if they don't authorize it in writing, it didn't happen. It's just like a medical record. So, what about communication to anyone but the patient? Now, this is the one that really bites, but it's pretty clear. It says specifically there is no exception to the encryption rule, period. So you can't call up your retina guy and go, Okay, this is not encrypted. We know if it gets out, it's a problem, but we're going to agree to do it anyway. There's no, that is not possible. You cannot do it, period. So any outside referral that contains patient information, it has to be through a secured email or by fax. Interesting enough, fax is still considered a secure transmission. Again, not an IT person, but you cannot encrypt or decrypt facts. It's impossible. It's actually one of the most secured transmission forms known to man. But as we all know, the non-secured part of facts is where? At the other end. Exactly. So, the government has said facts is cool. It's not a problem. If not, you have to use secured email. And you can also do this a lot of times, like I said, through your EMR system through the portal that's in there. All right, so summary. This is my opinion. I don't think you can communicate to anybody unless it's encrypted. And I put, that's, can't say that for sure, but then this happened. And this was just this year. So this is Children's Hospital in Dallas, Texas, my hometown, and they just got hit for $2.3 million for failure to encrypt their communications with their patients. And this was not the result of a breach. This was simply a matter of they walked in and say, how do you communicate with your patients? And they said, however they communicate with us. And it was like, write the check. So no breach, no release of information, $2.3 million. So now I think I can go back to this one and erase that and go, I think I can say this. So you really need to pay attention to that. All right. So what about social media? How does it play into all this? Well, what's hot? There was the first thing on the opening slide. I hate social media. I'll start with that. Okay? I hate them all. I dabble in Facebook because it's a really good way to keep up with my children and grandchildren. But other than that, I despise all of these things. Maybe you do too. I don't know. But I don't even know what half of those are. And that's only about half of them. Okay? Let me show you some statistics that will blow your mind. This is the point you need to understand whether you are participating in social media or not. Your patients are. And at what level? 
How do you like that one? 31 million messages across the internet per minute. Per minute. 510,000 Facebook posts per minute. Per minute. Here's the one, though, that I really want you to see. 17,000 17, company profiles viewed per minute. That's your website. People are looking. And it's not the millennials. It's my mother. <laughs> my 87-year-old mother is looking up her doctors on the internet. This is the common thing people are doing. How many of you are doing it? How many of you are searching company profiles before you go buy something from them? It's the norm, isn't it? It's going to be the norm for your practice as well. So your patients are doing this whether you're doing it or not. 2.5 billion Snapchats per day. You know, Snapchat, that's the one that a lot of people like to use because it supposedly goes away. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Nothing goes away in the internet. Plus, we, I shouldn't even tell this story. I won't tell you the details of it. Uh, but we were sitting with the president of the uh, North Dakota Optometric Association, and she calls it not Snapchat, but something else that I won't repeat. And, and kids are doing it. And so there, it's kind of a pornographic twist on Snapchat. And they think it's cool because it goes away, but what they don't understand is there's this thing called print screen. And so they just print screen it, and they've got it forever. So it's crazy what people are doing on the Internet, you know. And I know I've told my kids, BJ tells her kids, and hopefully y'all do too, it's like, you know, everything you put on there, it's on there forever, guys. It is on there forever. So be aware of that. All right. This is the one I want you to realize, though. This is national statistics, 1.72 hours of paid time online. This is what your people at the front desk are doing. I don't want to be accusatory, but they are because they're in the average. Now, they may not be the mean of the bell curve, but they're in there somewhere. So you may have some that are worse than this, less than this. I don't know. But the point is this is very, very common because it's easy to do because of this little device. And if you think, well, I watch them, they're not using that, what about this? Because there's the new way they're doing it. And that's very inconspicuous. So employees are doing this, you know, and I'm, I, I remember once I said, you know, you've got to decide how am I going to handle this in my office, and I'm such a hard liner. I'm like, I'd put a box at the back, and before, when you come in and check in your cell phone, you know, goes in the box, and then somebody said, you're an idiot. So don't you understand that young people, when you take their cell phone away from it, it's like taking their heart and ripping it out of their chest? You know, you're going to have a big employee morale problem on your hands. Like, well, yeah, that's why I'm an idiot and why I don't own a practice. And you do. So there you go. But the point is, we do have to be aware of this and to some degree control this. And I'm going to tell you what you can do to control this. And that's the rest of what we need to talk about. So what's hot? Everything. Everything. This has become the largest area of HR management for the last two years running. I mean, the number of laws they're passing related to this, staggering, staggering. This is my favorite. So this came out of my home state. This was the Texas Workforce Commission, and they said, although social media regulation and technology has improved dramatically, there has been no corresponding upswing in common sense or decency in society. The government said that. <laughs> and we don't have a problem on our hands? Really? What does this guy say? Employers must realize that social media is the new news, not CNN. Problem? The postings are so fast, no one can keep up with whether it's valid or not. So you all hear the fake news, okay? You've heard that over and over now. What's your biggest source of fake news in America? Facebook, probably. And it's not, it's like, well, should, they should do something. 31 million posts a minute. How do you monitor that? You can't. It's impossible. So this is the source of news. So I'll ask anybody in this room, you know, I'm sure nobody was interested in the horrible outcomes of the people that were in the hurricanes, 
but you wanted to keep up with what was happening with the hurricanes. How many people watched CNN and how many people hit Facebook? That was a loaded question because you raised your hand. It's like both, I guess. So how many people watched Facebook to watch the postings on what was happening in the hurricanes? Yeah, okay, come on. This is, yeah, let's all be honest. So we're doing it. And our patients are doing it too. Our patients are doing it too. All right. What are our four legal challenges as an employer? We have to protect the data. Holy cow, 31 million posts per minute. And now the government says, and you are responsible for making sure, and we're going to find out, yes, that is correct. Employees have rights, tons of them. And this is where it really gets interesting. We'll talk about that in a minute. Disclosure. So how many of y'all, I mean, everybody in this room does this, right? Facebook, how many, how many day, times a day are you hitting like, 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 like? Okay? Well, the government has said when your employee does that, that's an endorsement of you and your practice. So we'll talk about how you handle that in a minute as well. And then it says, and you're the one that has the responsibility for monitoring this, not Mark Zuckerman and not the government but you, business owner. So, thank you very much. All right. Here are the six social media problems for healthcare practitioners, and don't, we're gonna go through each one of these. So, here's the first one. So this starts right back where we started at the beginning. Communicating with our patients by text and email. Whether it be Facebook or web page or whatever it is. And you notice my first comment is, this is not a good idea. But we obviously have to have exceptions to that because it is the norm of how we run businesses today. So what are the exceptions? Number one, you got to be secured. That's the bottom line. That's numero uno. That is so important that the government, who is only 99.9% .9 crazy, has come out and said encryption is basically your get out of jail free card. Because we can't ask you to protect patients' data beyond what technology allows you to do. And encryption is the highest level of protection that is known in, in, in this whole thing. So as long as you're doing that, the government has said, we will very likely give you a free ride because you're doing everything you can possibly do to some degree. All right, number two, what if the patient initiates it? That's better than us initiating it. But here's the two big ones right here. Generic, generic, generic. When we want to communicate, it's much better if we communicate to the patient base generically and we talk about things generically to them. So here's an example of what not to do. <clears throat> or to do very carefully, I will say. I'll never say not to do, but do very carefully. Go through your patient base, find all your glaucoma patients, Send them out a specific email that says, as one of my glaucoma patients, I wanted you to understand that Alcon now has a new drug called Travitan Z that is just fabulous for treating glaucoma. I notice you're not on it. You, would you schedule an appointment so we can come out and talk? You absolutely are going straight to jail. <laughs> you can't do that. Okay? What can we do? Dear whoever, our practice strives to have the latest technology in glaucoma care. Uh, we have wonderful and up-to-date ways to manage and treat your glaucoma. Not your glaucoma, to treat glaucoma. You have to watch your words. Treat glaucoma. Please schedule an appointment at your convenience. I did not say anything about that patient. I just said, we got great stuff, didn't say who, what it was, and you might be able to benefit from it. Now you're cool. So you have to pick your words very, very carefully. All right? All right. So here's one that comes up all the time. So you have whatever you've got. Uh, demand force or whatever. Uh, your little reference thing goes out and they post on there, I think this is the worst office I've ever been to in my life. They ignored me. Their prices are too high and the doctor was a jerk. And it's like, well, I don't think I want to let that stand. What do I do? So you've all probably experienced this, and how do I address that situation? All right, first one says, 
don't respond. Call the patient to discuss and resolve. So if you've heard my compliance lectures before, you may remember I always say there's three answers. Everybody remember that? Okay. The best one, the one that's probably okay, and the one where you just get your checkbook out. So that first one is the best one, maybe. The problem there is from a business standpoint, you have left it open that somebody says you're a jerk. And I don't think you want that out there. So what's the second best? Answer in non-specific terms, then call them. So you put on your posting, thank you for your response. Our office strives for excellence and care. We will certainly be contacting you to discuss this ish, to discuss your concerns about our practice. Then you call them up on the phone and resolve it. Do not get in email wars with these people or webinar wars or texting wars with these people. It's the worst possible thing you can do. Okay? The last one, like I said, that's the get the checkbook answer and that's just fight with them. Fight with them open on the internet. You're going to lose and at some point you're violating their privacy and you're dead. So just don't do it. Just don't do it. Here's the other one. How many people do this? So Mary gets new glasses, you take a picture, post it on your Facebook page. Nobody's doing this? Please. This is wonderful marketing. You have to do it the right way, but it's wonderful marketing, okay? Look at Mary's new frames. Doesn't she look great in her new frames? Blah, blah, blah. That's, that's great you know, marketing of your business. What you can't do is put anything in there that might be related to Mary's personal information. Like I said, look how Mary's new lenses aren't so thick anymore. Okay? Or look how Mary's lenses don't glare or something like that. But you can put in there, look, Mary just got a new glass. They're wonderful. It's also advisable that the patient authorize you to do that. So in your HIPAA stuff, whoever you have it from or don't have as the case may be, there's something called an authorization and they should sign that to say, yes, I authorize you to post me on your web page or on Facebook or whatever with my new glasses. So that's probably cool to do it that way. It's, I know a lot of people that do it and it's great marketing. All right, blogs. Uh, I think I've talked about this before, but it's definitely a big issue when we get into social media because this is what we're talking about. Uh, all of these blogs are social media. We're just talking among ourselves. So we're not talking to our patients, we're talking to ourselves. Still social media. I'm just waiting for the landmark case. I'm just waiting for it to happen. Um, it's act one case has already happened in California, uh, but I'm just waiting for the landmark case to hit because you have to be very, very careful about what you say on these blogs. Specifically, you have to be very careful about the case presentations on the blogs, where they'll put up, say, here my 63-year-old patient that works at Walmart came in and she's got this big lump on her eye. What do you think it is? And there's the picture of half of their face. That is unequivocally a HIPAA violation. And all that needs to happen is for that to get out and that patient is, I mean, you're done. And we're just waiting for the first one to happen. Now they've really started to cool it after a bunch of us have said, y'all really got to stop doing this. Uh, but if you participate in that kind of activity, just be very careful. You have to be very generic. And you see they are very specific about this. Any mark, irregularity, or pathology that could identify the patient. So one of the answers they come up with is my patient authorized me to do this. That's probably not going to hold up in court. Uh, the courts have already ruled that a patient does not have the authority to waive their HIPAA rights. So they signed a piece of paper that wasn't valid, essentially. So they could come back and change their mind and say, well, that piece of paper wasn't valid anyway and you're still in trouble. So point here is be very, very careful with these blogs. Be very careful with them. Uh, okay. This is probably the one that is most used and the most dangerous. And that is using the internet or Facebook or Twitter or whatever you want to use. And I noticed y'all were talking about HR when we came in and how do we evaluate applicants. Here's the way not to do it. You can't get their Facebook page and look them up 
and make decisions about them based on what's on their Facebook page or their last Snapchat page or what they put on Twitter or anything like that. That is absolutely blatantly illegal. Now there are certain professional companies, you can run criminal background checks and things like that on people, but don't get caught doing this because every one of these cases goes to the favor of the applicant or the employee. Don't ever fire an employee because you saw something they did on Facebook. You know, their bikini picture and you go, I don't want those kind of folks working for me. You're dead. You're dead. They're going to win every single time. So be very careful with this kind of activity. Like I said, don't do it. Now, <clears throat> Remember the 1.72 hours. So how do we regulate that? Because I don't know about you, but I got a bunch of employees and if I'm paying them a couple of hours a day to play on Facebook, I don't think I like that. I don't think I like them doing it for an hour a day. I'm not sure I like them doing it for 30 minutes a day. That's my money. To be honest with you, if you work for a federal agency, they call that stealing if you're actually working on government property, surfing the internet when you're supposed to be doing your job, that is actually theft by federal law. It's just a bad idea otherwise. So how do we regulate this? And I, and I know at this point a lot of people are going, my employees don't do that. And I'm going to contend that they do. Uh, so I don't know if I've ever introduced this term before. But a long time ago, a guy taught me a term, uh, let's see if it's MBWA. MBWA. Anybody ever heard that MBWA is practice management term? It's called management by walking around. Management by walking around. And basically, you just go be a patient in your office. So, you know, schedule out 30 minutes, schedule out an hour, or have your office manager do it. Somebody, go sit in your reception room and watch what goes on in your office. Go sit around in the dispensary and watch what goes on. It's management by walking around. You'll be amazed. Even the best run your practice, you might be amazed. And this guy's got a machine going. But he might be amazed. If we just go look, sometimes we see things that we don't want to see. So I, I would encourage you, management by walking around. 